dear uh, alumni, dear students, dear all ESSEC community, it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight at uh, the ESSEC uh, Asia Pacific campus for that uh, quite exciting event. Uh, as you probably know, this event is organized by the student club, Mardi de Sec, and uh, Mardi de Sec is a very famous club uh, which organizes uh, debates with uh, business and political uh, leaders in France and here. And we, it's, we are very pleased to see that uh, the Mardi de Sec is now expanding his activities in Asia, in the region, and uh, we hope that uh, our new campus which will open in uh, January, will uh, allow us to uh, welcome more and more events uh, like uh, this one. So I uh, leave the floor to uh, Victor and Alban. Thank you very much. So before the discussion begins, I would like to thank you for being so numerous to attend this discussion. But now let me tell you a few words about the students on Les Mardis des Ecs. So, it's uh, the first foreign student in, uh, in France, <coughs> and for more than 50 years, we try to challenge the curiosity of SX students by creating a direct link between them and the public leading figures. We set up 15 debates a year in Paris and in Singapore, mainly with politicians. For instance, we had um, all the presidents, all the French presidents of the Fifth Republic except General de Gaulle. We had, like, Laurent Fabius uh, some months ago, Minister of Foreign Affairs in France. Also people from the business sphere. We had uh, the CEO of Air France, Mr. De Juniac. We also had the CEO of Accenture, Pierre Lanterne. And finally, some people from the civil sphere, like football players or economists or sociologists. And now we would like to make it more global by setting debate in Singapore more often. So it's the second debate in Singapore, and I hope we'll have more and more. So now I wish you a great debate, and thank you again. Mr. Blanche, Mr. Duvertre, dear audience, good evening and welcome to this new debate of the Mardi des Sec, sponsored by the audit and consulting firm Mazar, the Groupe La Poste, and the consulting firm Weeb. I, I have to confess, I was very honored when I was offered the opportunity to introduce our two guests, Mr. Blanche and Mr. Vlet. But I shouldn't. I was very pleased indeed to have the chance to stain a little those beautiful skirt way too neat of those two men coming from the high sphere of Singapore. What a disappointment. What a disappointment when I started to search for all your hide and flows, all your little and shameful secrets, all your imperfections, hoping to put them under the spotlight. An unpaid tax, a little relationship with Kazakhstan, a small extramarital affair, but no, nothing extravagant. Little did I know whom I would meet. I was ready to meet Borodin and Garin, the two revolutionaries described by Marot, the baguette pointing toward the rising sun. Or maybe a Rastignac, lost in the Asian political doggerel. Or even a Gentis Khan with a beret. I'm actually left with the honeton of Montaigne, Pascal, or Boileau, maybe more exotism, or at best tout tartuf, with less clumsiness. First, Mr. Dubertre. I was more than excited when I started reading the article on the website Le Petit Journal, which began with the, descri with the description of, I quote, an original career path. Excitement that fell as quickly as the enthusiasm of the partisan of Sarkozy after his return. The Holy Trinity, Father HEC, the Science Po Son, and the Holy Spirit Enna. You could have been a little more original. <laughs> well, little folks sighed when I noticed that you came from a public prepa. Too bad we're talking about Henri IV. So, you are a graduate of Enna and with honors, as you became Inspector of Finance. However, still no condescension that could serve me for a caricature of the man greedy of power, terrorist, or selfish. No. Humility you is your watchword, emphasized during those two years that you dedicated to the economic mission in Beijing, where the optimism and zest of for life that the Chinese embodied awoke in you the desire of self-sacrifice. My religion is kindness, 
said Mr. Duberti and the Dalai Lama in one united voice. Homesick, you flew back to France where you joined La Caisse des Dépôts and became quickly a member of the executive committee. You are now 37. Rare enough to be mentioned, but do not believe that Mr. Dubertre sees in it a possible source of complacency. He focuses on sustainable growth and human inputs that bring that position. Therefore, so much self-denial, self-sacrifices, and dedication made you the ideal candidate for a Singapore embassy that you joined in 2013. <coughs> in short, I was expecting to meet Frank Underwood, I end up with the new Gandhi. As for you, Mr. Blanche, <coughs> a swift ascension in a leading company in the luxury industry could not be done without some skeleton in the closet, some bloody hands, and yet, after graduating from Euromed, you choose to follow the example of Kabai, Ben Arthur, or Gibarge, and move, move to Newcastle, where you got an MBA in 1999. Then, you follow the movement initiated by Cahuzac or Balkany and become project manager at Cartier in Switzerland. Determined to climb the corporate ladder. Marketing manager, then marketing director for the Latin American and Caribbean region, you will return to Paris as a retail development director to become quickly chief of staff to the president. However, the fairy tale does not end there, as you became regional, regional director of the South East, East Asia and Australia in Singapore, where you live a quiet and peaceful life with your wife and three children. All is well, that ends well. <clears throat> in short, nothing really interesting. So I decided to talk a little about me. Um, however, do not think I'm using this situation uh, to promote myself or to make find myself seen in front of two representatives of field that I'm very interested in. Uh, by rewarding them with the most laudatory portrait or even worse that I'm looking for an internship. No. <laughs> so after a promoted class, I followed your example and joined a prestigious business school, ESSEC. Uh, still following your example, I decided to do my first inter internship in the heart of Asia, Singapore, where the joy experienced by my work on Ocho Road it emphasized my interest in luxury. <laughs> even in a even if we were small look at Bukit Bita, Bitima, made me realize that diplomacy uh, could be a feasible option. I was torn with those two paths. I wanted to work in an influencing sector in Singapore, but as, as it, ha it is very hard to know if a French declaration of war could have more impact than a 50 increase on conscious price in Singapore, uh, I prefer to give you both my resume. So here is it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and have a great day. <laughs> okay, so first of all, I would like to thank both of you for having accepted our invitation. And Victor tried to introduce you accurately but also humoristically. Would you like to add something on what he said? Or will we just switch directly to the debate? When do you want to start your internship? Okay, so as Victor said, uh, you are both very young but very talented. And we would like to know how did you manage to become who you are today so fast? What are the key moments of your career? You can you can you can begin the, your answer. Okay. Well first of all, good evening to all here and thank you for welcoming me on, on this occasion. I understand this is the second time you're holding a such forum uh, here in Singapore uh, after first edition, actually with my predecessor, I understand, two years ago, so you'll be able to make some comparisons, interesting ones. Um, uh, turning points in, in a career, I don't know, I suppose the decision to, I mean, honestly, the first milestone obviously <coughs> was entering a school of management and, and through that having a direct exposure <coughs> to life in companies and I had a variety of experiences there. I spent one year, whole year of internship with Ron Poulin Corre, which was later brought back by Sanofi, so a pharmaceutical lab. I suppose that's an important uh, step. Uh, I suppose the, the, the next one would be the decision to become a civil servant, actually. So aiming for and uh, getting in there, managing to get out somehow. And, uh, and I suppose that's important because it directs part of your life, at least the beginning of your proper career, beyond internships, secondments, and that sort of things. 
So that, that was important. I suppose a, a, a third important step is the international exposure. Because I, I got a bit of that through internships when I was at HSC or, or later on uh, at ENA, actually. Uh, but uh, the decision to go to Beijing as economic counselor within the French embassy was, I suppose, also an important uh, milestone for me in my career because that's where I really got the sort of more international feel about it. And I suppose that, that determined then my my wish, my will to come back to Asia at some point, and, uh, which I, I managed to achieve by coming back here as, as ambassador to Singapore. So I suppose that's the three main you know, steps forward. Uh, I don't know, after all, I, I'm not sure one becomes what one is uh, just through professional experiences. So, but that's maybe more, more personal, but I suppose that what you do for civil society, what you, the, the people you get to meet also help to, to build your personality. So, but the, professionally speaking, I suppose that would be the three items I'd highlight. Thank you. I think it's going to be very dull because I'm going to go down exactly the same path. Um, I guess uh, school, uh, business school, uh, was probably the first defining uh, moment. Um, after the uh, first year where I ran, uh, like uh, most of you probably did, uh, to become uh, either president of uh, uh, an association, BDE, BDS, or whatever, and, uh, and failing to it, so then uh, realizing that uh, being, becoming a civil servant was definitely not the route for me, um, I decided to pursue more a, um, a business uh, career and, um, and was... Uh, I guess call it fortune. Uh, fortunate enough to uh, to land a uh, an internship at uh, at Cartier. Uh, so that was at the end of the first year of, of business school. And to be honest, I haven't really left since. Um, end of the first uh, uh, internship, I was asked if I could uh, stay on. I guess the project I was working on, nobody really wanted to take on afterwards. Uh, it was after sales service for leather straps. Which, if you ask to anybody who works in the, and the watchmaking uh, world is probably the biggest nightmare there is, but a great experience. And so I would say, if you start with the hardest, uh, hardest challenge at the beginning, it's always a good route afterwards. It can only become easier. So I did that. Uh, then at the time, we still had to do our, our military service, um, which I did, uh, again, uh, avoiding becoming a civil servant. And instead of that, working for Cartier uh, in Miami, there were worst, uh, worst things to be done. Um, but I guess the experience I had from Latin America, I had lived uh, when I was uh, in my younger years with my parents in Latin America. My knowledge of Spanish, my knowledge of Latin America really uh, helped me. Um, so I, I spent uh, what was supposed to be, at the time was 16 months, which turned out to be 10 years. Um, not because I enjoyed particularly the beach, uh, which was, uh, I was always trying to explain that to my, uh, to my colleagues in Central, but more because the, the zone in itself was uh, really uh, uh, exhilarating. Lots of things happening, very diverse, uh, multiculturalism at the heart of it, uh, a lot of challenges also in, uh, in dealing with uh, changing economic environments, currencies. Um, so that was, that was a real defining moment. He, the, uh, the, my experience in, uh, in, Latin, in Latin America, Miami being the unofficial capital of Latin America, by the way. And, um, and the, third, uh, the third phase is um, uh, having the privilege of working with our uh, former president, uh, Mr. Farnas, uh, and I spent uh, four years as his uh, chief of staff. Uh, very diverse, uh, very curious uh, four years, uh, open book on many things, and, uh, and a great experience, uh, again. Um, underlining uh, behind all of that, I think more than anything was the, the sheer enjoyment of uh, getting up every morning, having challenges to, uh, to, uh, to face and uh, new things to learn. So if I have one piece of advice to give, uh, make sure that you do select your first internship with care, uh, that you do uh, come around with your resumes. Um, do, do, do uh, yes, choose it with, uh, with great care because I can, I believe, I definitely believe it can define uh, most of your life afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you talk a lot about your foreign experience, uh, your Chinese experience, your uh, Latin America one. Uh, do you think that expatriation is really a career uh, accelerator? Do you think it can boost your career to go abroad and uh, start your professional path here? 
I don't know if it's just about career boosting. Actually, I think at this stage, the world being what it is regarding globalization and so on, just not going abroad would be silly. At some point, I do think you need to get international exposure, um, be confronted with different cultural differences, and and play your part too. And I think every one of us has a responsibility in that respect to help internationalize our companies or. Uh, just make sure that people-to-people -people exchanges are at a high level. I think that's part of a global picture. So it's it's certainly, it, 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 yeah, it's not career booster. It's just I think it's a necessity at this stage. I do think that if you take career starting now, if at some point you don't go abroad, I think you'll get find it more difficult. In the, maybe in 10 years, maybe in 20 years, maybe later than that. But I do think it's a, it's a sheer necessity at this stage. That's my feeling. Actually, my uh, my father was working in oil, so we, we traveled most of my uh, most of my youth. And I think if there was one uh, gift uh, my parents could have given me, given me was uh, was definitely that one. The opportunity at a young age of uh, of uh, being exposed to uh, many different cultures, uh, learning languages without really having to learning uh, to to learn them. Uh, and it's uh, so the exposure, obviously, to the international, and, and I agree with Mr. Ambassador, is not necessarily a question of uh, career path, uh, although it may help. It's also a question of personal development. Um, in today's world, you cannot uh, uh, really fully fulfill yourself uh, if you do not understand what uh, your environment is about. And the environment today is definitely defined um, not only by our beautiful country, uh, but what surrounds it and, uh, and beyond. So, yes, travel, um, if you can do with work, it's great. Uh, also travel on a personal standpoint. Uh, curiosity um, is probably the best driver for uh, openness, open-mindedness, and development. That's my, that's my take on it. Okay, cool, thank you very much. Now, now the business in Asia, with an increased emphasis on building a fair and exclusive society in Singapore, we can observe that it is more and more difficult for an expatriate to get a job. Do you have any insight about this? For example, Mr. The Ambassador, why, why, are there, why are there so much difficulties in obtaining employment, employment passes for, for working in Singapore? Yeah, well, I think the point is not just that it's getting difficult, and it is getting more difficult indeed, but, but to understand the, the, the reasons for that, what does it stem from? And I think basically it stems from two different origins. On, on the one hand, you've got a um, uh, social aspect, I would say, which is the, the fact that if you look at Singapore over the past 10 years, its population has grown by about 1 million people, right? plus 1 million people in 10 years, to make figures simple. Um, and of course, the natural growth has been, uh, population growth has been very low during that period. As you probably know, fertility rate is extremely low in Singapore, it's about 1.2 child per woman currently. So obviously it's been that through an inflow of foreigners that this population increase has been achieved. And definitely you have to acknowledge the fact, and I think that's been very clear in 2011 especially during the general elections, that there's some degree of resentment from the local Singaporeans regarding this inflow of foreigners. So that's basically the social dimension of it, how the population actually feels about it it's not a matter of not liking foreigners, it's also a matter of how has this influx been managed in terms of infrastructures in particular. So that's one aspect of the problem. The other aspect of the problem is that uh, when you look at the uh, economic prospects for Singapore, I mean overall Singapore has uh, achieved remarkable things since its independence. At the same time, if you look back just a few years from now, Definitely, there's a bit of an issue around competitiveness, productivity in this economy. Wages have gone up quite fast, and uh, costs in general, and productivity hasn't necessarily grown as fast. So in terms of comp competitiveness, Singapore has lost some ground, especially when you compare with other ASEAN countries. Uh, and in that framework, quite naturally, I mean, I think the... Uh, government authorities here have in mind that they need to find some way uh, to bridge that gap and to make sure that productivity can raise again and definitely making sure that not too many people uh, come into Singapore 
is a way, is a way, is it the right one, I don't know, but is a way to make sure that you force companies to improve their productivity. So I also, my understanding is that there's also this economic aspect of the question. So anyway, I'd say there are probably two reasons when you analyze uh, the whole thing, why Singapore is taking that path. And you can probably bet that it's not going to change in the near future. Of course, there'll be the question of the next general elections. So that might be at some point, for some reason, a turning point. I don't know in which, in which direction. But as ever in Singapore, they've got a sense of long term. And I think the white paper on population outlined the prospect with a um, growth which is estimated up to 6.9 million persons living here in Singapore by 2030. And this isn't actually a target. I mean, Prime Minister Lee recently explained that 6.5 would probably be a better figure, and that uh, 6.9 wasn't a target. It has, doesn't have to be reached, actually. Which means that the constraint, the current constraints, I think we just have to adapt and live with that. Now, of course, representing France here, I'm particularly cautious on that issue to make sure that there aren't excessive constraints that are being put. That indeed, when foreign talent needs to be imported, then we make sure it can get imported. And also that in certain areas, because not all sectors are hit to the same points, we do manage to get the workforce that is needed by companies. Typically, the sector of food and beverage is direly hit by these measures. I think the Singapore authorities are fully aware of that. Nevertheless, up to now, they kept their stance on that question. So basically, I think it's a national choice for us working here, trying to develop companies here. We have to cope with it. And of course, we remain very vigilant. So we have a very close dialogue with the Economic Development Board, with the Ministry of Manpower also, to make sure that this doesn't go too far. And up to now, to be honest, I mean, I mean our friend here will, will explain this, his point of view, but uh, overall, the picture isn't that dismal at this stage. The feedback we get from companies is not that bad. Of course, it puts additional constraints, definitely. But at the same time, we have to understand the point of view of Singaporean authorities. That's my point of view. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't think the, uh, the, the picture is that dismal at all. Um, I, would, I would take a different... Uh, a point of view on on the uh, on answering to your question and give you probably more of a perspective based to the uh, uh, luxury industry as a, as a whole. Um, it's true that traditionally, uh, and we've seen quite a radical uh, shift over the last uh, 15 to 20 years in uh, how uh, the industry was uh, was actually uh, developing itself, uh, how it was uh, exporting this great uh, craftsmanship and the great talents uh, and the creativity. Of, uh, of, uh, of France uh, abroad. Uh, if you look back, most of the uh, big luxury maisons uh, 15, 20 years ago uh, had a very typical uh, setup where you had probably, I would say, more than half of the, uh, of the workforce, uh, which was French, so uh, expatriates, um, and predominantly, uh, obviously, in the management positions, um, marketing, communication, and to some extent, into the sales. And over the years, we've seen this progressive shift with a, uh, an increasing number of, uh, of uh, uh, team members being from actually uh, local background and, uh, and local, uh, local knowledge. Um, and there was quite a, quite a lot of debate internally in saying, is that the right way? Are we going in the right direction? Aren't we losing somehow the spirit uh, of those maisons? Aren't we, uh, are those workforces, we're local? Uh, going to be able to understand what uh, French luxury stands for, etc. Um, and, and my answer is yes. Um, if I look today, for instance, at Cartier, um, beyond myself, I think we were, were three not to be Singaporeans. Uh, do I find that to be a weakness? Far from it. I think we have a lot to learn, not only in terms of uh, local culture, uh, lo local culture uh, consumer behaviors, but at the same time, uh, I think what we're all speaking uh, within the Maison is universalism, culturalism. Uh, and that's the most important aspect. It's not because you're French that uh, suddenly you uh, are born with a preconceived knowledge of what luxury is supposed to be about. Uh, I think there's so much greater richness in being able to share uh, our creativity, our savoir-faire, our vision of what luxury is, 
uh, internationally. And actually, it's been very deeply rooted in, uh, in the Maison Cartier for over 168 years, uh, where the founding fathers, the, the Cartier brothers, traveled the world. And a lot of the cre creations and the styles uh, that you see in our Maison today uh, draw their inspiration from Asia, from India, uh, from the New World. from the so. That uh, diversity, I think, is, is uh, definitely important. Um, now, being able to bring talent uh, from abroad, I think, is an advantage. Uh, it needs to be uh, sustained uh, because we also need to help our teams to, to travel uh, across. Uh, my predecessor used to be, uh, um, who now is the, the head for Louis Vuitton, uh, was Australian. Uh, of Greek descent and uh, he worked here in Singapore and then after uh, he moved to Europe and then China and, and I think this is really where the, uh, the, the true benefits of the expatriate is. It's not about your nationality and I, I understand that the French <coughs> ambassador will, will drive and, and, and so rightly uh, the position of the French. In, in our industry the universalism, the multicultural aspect is the most important. <coughs> If I may just add yeah. on that, actually, I, I, I didn't want to sound nationalistic. The issue is not just about having French nationals being able to come here, working whether for French, either for French company or for the Singaporean or international company. It's more about making sure that companies, and in my case, French companies, are able to recruit the, the people and the talents that they need. And, and that includes obviously people coming from abroad necessarily because the workforce base here in Singapore isn't that wide. You have to be realistic about that. Even though, I mean, the, the achievements in terms of uh, higher education here in Singapore are quite remarkable. But still, the sheer numbers make it difficult. So it's not about just making sure that we can have French nationals coming here, but also, uh, as you said, it's a matter of uh, having the right mix of international people they might come from Australia, from the US, from the UK, from wherever you want, but just to make sure that a French company wants to hire those people can do it here in Singapore. Thank you. So you explained that um, having foreign uh, workers at your company is a really a threat, but isn't it also a difficulty? Uh, do we do business the same way uh, in Asia? Uh, as in uh, Latin America and North America or even Europe, is it difficult to adapt the, the, the policy of the company in each of those uh, continents? Yeah. I guess yes and no. Uh, obviously you always have uh, to adapt when you go to a new environment, uh, culturally speaking, uh, it is important. but. Um, this whole process of having to adapt, if I take my, my personal example, I, I moved uh, to Asia a year and a half ago. Never really uh, lived in Asia, well, never lived in Asia before, traveled a bit, but didn't really have that extensive experience of, of Asia. Um, what does it force us to do is actually to, to really pay particular attention to your environment. And more often than not, when you do that, you can have a different perspective. Uh, you can look at things a different way. And, um, and maybe bring new ideas or new solutions to, uh, to different problems. So, yes, it is difficult at the beginning, uh, but I think it's enriching also at the same time. So, the benefits are far greater than the, uh, than the risks or the drawbacks, that's for sure. And as you said earlier, um, you are like three people at Cartier, three French people at Cartier, but how do you manage to keep the, the, the legacy and the, and the traditions that are made? Cartier is a maison, like you said earlier. How do we manage to keep that with all these people that are not uh, come, that not familiar with that kind of thing? Well, actually, out of the three, uh, there were only two to be French. The third one is Swiss, although some people <laughs> might debate whether they're really uh, different from the French. Um, well, actually, it's it's uh, it's not because, and I go back to what I was saying earlier on. It's not because uh, you uh, you're born with a French passport that you necessarily know better uh, what the Maison is about. Uh, and um, if you take, for instance, our creative department in, uh, in Paris, uh, so we have uh, designers uh, who design our jewelry, our, our watches, um, and um, I think I did, last time I did the count, we have roughly 60 people working at different uh, creation studios, and out of the 16 people, uh, 60 people, sorry, the 17 different nationalities. Uh, now, does it mean that they do not uh, 
draw uh, Cartier creations. Of course, they all do, and they all give their their sensitivity and their their culture goes in and their experiences personal, and uh, go into each one of their designs. So I think the richness of the maison definitely draws from the fact that we are not only French, uh, but that we have uh, a more global uh, perspective. Yeah. Definitely. Um, as for you, Mr. Um, how do you manage to promote the French workforce in this uh, in this spectrum uh, in this uh, contest that we saw? Well, to, to to be honest, in itself, we're not talking about the promotion of the French workforce. Even though, of course, we we keen to have French nationals coming here, finding jobs, and developing their own businesses or finding work. It's more about the development and then uh, French companies, basically. That's the main focus. And uh, to put it in a nutshell, there are two sorts of things we try to do. We, we often tend to distinguish between two types of diplomacy. So there's economic diplomacy, as, there's what we call diplomacy d'influence, uh, diplomacy of influence, so to speak. And that broadly covers topics like, uh, like culture, for instance, scientific exchanges, university exchanges, higher education in general, and so on. And, I mean, very clearly, a strong emphasis, a very strong emphasis has been put on economic diplomacy for some years now, but even more so over the past two years with Minister Fabius. And economic diplomacy basically means, and this is precisely focusing on companies, doing two things, direct actions, that benefit our companies, and I'll go back to that, and also indirect actions through this diplomacy of influence, making sure that everything an embassy does in a given country regarding culture, higher education, and so on, is done in accordance with the priorities of the companies and makes sense for them too. Right? It, I mean, I suppose that traditionally an embassy had different fields of action and those, there, there wasn't any sort of dialogue between these different fields. Everything was in silos. And now that's definitely changed quite a lot. And we try to make sure that what we do, especially in the cultural field, indeed benefits our companies somehow. So you might ask how, that's an abstract notion, how does that work? Well, typically, we identified here a form of weakness in what France does here in the cultural field. You've got, and that's been going on for years and years, number of French cultural events here in Singapore. Actually, we've doubled them since 2009. In 2009, we signed an intergovernmental sorry, agreement between the two countries and the cultural field. Since then, we've managed to double the number of French cultural events here in Singapore, and this year you'll, you will have had about 80 of them, which is quite sizable. But at the same time, because so many people come to Singapore, because so many countries want to illustrate the richness of their culture here in Singapore, because everyone knows it's the hub here, you've got 15 million tourists coming and so on, everyone is more or less trying to do the same and organizing lots and lots of things. So, in short, we've lost visibility. Now, that's the reason why we decided that we should set up again something that has existed in past years, which is a true French cultural season. Two months dedicated to French culture where you have a greater density of events and hence a greater visibility from, for, for, for the whole population. So we've been working on that, but it's, a, it's called Voila. It's a name maybe some of you have heard, Voila, a, it's a pun, there's a play on the words, of course, with a la, a Singaporean la. And Voila, anyway, is used uh, all the time in, in, in business meetings and so on, even by Anglo-Saxon, English-speaking people. So it's a good name. So anyway, it has existed in the past. We're setting up uh, a new, I would say, and um, uh, it's exactly the model, actually, that is being applied in Hong Kong. It has existed in Hong Kong. There's a French May in Hong Kong that has been going on for 20 years, which is proving very successful. Now, this is the illustration of a virtuous circle. If you manage to have cultural events that have greater visibility, then you're also able, and if you discuss beforehand with companies to know what they are interested in, in terms of PR, what are the sort of events they'd like to support? Then you manage to attract more funds to support these events, and then you're able actually to set up a more interesting program and set of events. So basically, this is typically the sort of thing we do. I'm not saying that Voila is just about economic diplomacy, but it's 
It's a, it's a way to attract more companies to get involved in the cultural programming and to make sure that for their own interest of customer relationship, they might find this interesting, supportive, and that behind their own name, the French brand, so to speak, France brand, is indeed of some help to them. So that's typically the sort of indirect work we try to do to help our companies. And then we, you have all the direct actions. I'm not going to go through all of them. But definitely the name of the game is sharper focus on the priorities. At some point, and I believe this was true especially in Singapore, because Singapore has been such a welcoming country to foreign investment for years and years and years, for decades actually, from the very start, I mean, all sorts of companies came here to Singapore in a variety of sectors, and they were always welcome. Now, I think that has changed a little bit. From the point of view of Singaporean authorities, there's a sharper focus on some sectors that they think are relevant here in Singapore, and they don't help as much other sectors, other companies, where they believe it's less relevant, because Singapore wants to become a different place and has to take into account its uh, geopolitical environment and what can happen in Indonesia and Malaysia in terms of company developments. So they high, aim, clearly are aiming in all sectors for innovation, solutions that provide gains in terms of productivity and so on. So we have to be very much more focused on what is relevant for Singapore. And typically there the embassy has a role to play to make everyone, especially in France, aware of those changes and how they should be not necessarily always look to Singapore as the right point of entry into Southeast Asia, but only when it's relevant in sectoral terms, considering the solutions that each company has to offer. So definitely, Bear, we have a lot to do in interactions with companies. And the other thing is that in terms of types of companies that need help, our, sh our focus again must be much sharper and we should focus not only on any sort of SMEs, but on growth SMEs and medium-sized companies. You're probably aware of the fact that when you look at the fabric, the economic fabric of France, we have a problem with the middle segments, what we call the entreprise de taille intermédiaire. Middle-sized companies are particularly weak and not internationalized enough in France. And that's where definitely an embassy with its trade promotion office, UB France, can do a lot together with other partners, typically the French Chamber of Commerce, to develop, to accompany these, uh, these, uh, these companies here in Singapore. But again, it has to be on relevant topics. So I think the overall move has been from sort of quantitative uh, objectives in terms of numbers of companies that were welcome here and so on, to something that is much more specific and long-lasting on some companies that really need help and are relevant to Singapore. Okay, thanks. So we talked a lot about France and French, so let's talk a little bit about the, the luxury industry in Asia. So we've heard a lot about the democratization of the luxury, of luxury brands and the rise of Asia as, uh, for luxury business. So would you say, Mr. Blanche, mm -hmm. that this rise is a danger or an opportunity for luxury brands? That's a good one. Um, everything is always an opportunity, provided that you handle it the right way. No, I think um, there's, there's al always a, a word that um, uh, needs to be uh, needs to be studied is the one of luxury. What does it really really entail? Uh, because uh, the press today has this tendency of um, of courting, uh, I mean, cutting corners and uh, putting in in under the big banner of luxury a lot of different things that are not necessarily linked to one another. Uh, you have fashion, you have jewelry, you have watchmaking, and each one of those. Uh, I would say crafts, savoir-faire are, are very distinct and very different. Um, and it's true uh, that in Asia we've seen quite a, uh, a, a growing uh, uh, appetite uh, for uh, all those different sectors, whether it's the fashion sector, uh, whether it's the uh, jewelry sector or the, uh, the watch, uh, watch industry. Um, so an opportunity? Yes, definitely. Um, the markets have grown. Uh, the, uh, the, also, the exposure, the uh, the knowledge of our uh, of our uh, clients has uh, drastically uh, increased, uh, which is for us uh, again an opportunity because it forces us to uh, to go deeper in our research, to uh, and to uh, always uh, come out with new creations and uh, and surprise them. Um, so it's definitely a fast evolving environment. Lots of it is obviously linked to demography. Um, 
the luxury sector, if you want to call it like that, was very much centered uh, in Europe and uh, North America for some time. And then the great opening of China took place, and that by sheer uh, numbers has uh, opened up uh, great potential and great markets. Um, what we're trying to do today is always to remain extremely consistent in what we do. Um, and I know this is probably the biggest challenge that, uh, that we have, at least at Cartier, that's what it is. Um, the two challenges we, we're trying to, uh, to address is what we call uh, brand dilution and brand confusion. So I'll explain quickly what those two concepts are. The brand dilution is uh, exactly what I was touching on right now, uh, luxury. Um, what is Cartier? is a luxury maison. No, actually Cartier is a jeweler by trade, by, by tradition, 168 years. Uh, and um, a watchmaker for nearly, uh, for just over, over a century. Uh, we're not a fashion maison, so we're very distinct uh, in the offering and, and, uh, and the experiences that our clients uh, will, will experience by, by pushing a, a Cartier door. Um, so it's very important each time we go into new markets, we engage with new clients, that we always explain and re-explain uh, that aspect. So that's uh, brand, uh, brand confusion and brand sorry, brand dilution, brand confusion uh, would be um, another element, is when we, uh, when we start to get too much of our creations on the market. Um, we dilute what we are about, uh, we have too much volume, too many boutiques, too many points of uh, contact with, uh, with the clientele. And uh, the best solution there is to always keep on top of mind one thing, is what is the experience of your client? Uh, what is he or she going to feel when he or she comes into one of your boutiques, when he or she is going to open the red box and is going to discover a, a Cartier creation. And as long as we know that in each one of our touch points, whether it's a boutique, whether it could be also digital, uh, as long as each time there's a different experience, then we're on the right path, we're in the right way. As soon as we start replicating too many of the same touch points, then it's an issue. So. To answer back to your question, in terms of Asia, yes, huge potential, great market, uh, challenges. Uh, we need to make sure that we always stay true to our image, to who we are, that we don't get diluted with other brands. Um, and uh, at the same time, that uh, we also keep a uh, strong focus on what our client experiences are. But how do you manage to control your image? You just had that. But, um for instance, in Asia, it's not like in, in Europe or in North America. The the stores are not are not owned by Cartier. It's always retailers that, like the Howard Blast for uh, watchmaking industry. So how do you manage to control the image? Uh, actually, it's if I if I may, uh, we do have our uh, Cartier-owned boutiques. For instance, if you take the uh, the flagship we have in uh, Iron or the boutique we have in MBS, those are Cartier boutiques that are uh, managed and operated by uh, by the Maison. Um, and if you take um, North America or Europe, you also have uh, watch dealers who are partners, like yep. the Hourglass, with whom, we, with whom we work. I think it's all about, in each one of the markets, finding the, the right... Uh, and I'm going back to the balance and the experience. Uh, not too many watch doors, and not too many boutiques, uh, and in ensuring that in each one of those boutiques or in each one of those partners' point of sale, when a client comes in, uh, they're going to have the same consistent service and the same consistent experience in terms of creations presented, in terms of knowledge of, of the teams and also of the level of service. At the same time, it also means that in terms of branding, uh, I think often when I'm asked what, what's your task is I'm here to, the way I see it is to develop a brand equity. Um, 168 years of history, we had people uh, before us at Cartier and we'll have people after us at Cartier. Uh, what's important is that uh, we help the Maison as during our tenure to develop its brand equity and we do that by, as I said, ensuring we have the best point of sale but also that our communication is consistent, that the storytelling we do is, is consistent uh, and that we do not uh, fail ultimately in the promises that we give to our clients. Um, so, we are used in the Mardi Lessec to do a little game. Uh, we'll just show you some images and you'll have to react to them uh, as quickly as you can. So, this one is for you, uh, Mr. Uh, Pibertri. 
Uh, as we all know, Singapore is a real melting pot of uh, nationalities. Uh, can you make, can you uh, 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 identify every one of those uh, nationalities? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I suppose uh, we have a, a Chinese. Where? Where? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, probably they? <laughs> I suppose they're all Singaporeans, right? Or, or not? Yeah, yeah, they are. Okay. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose the Chinese has the glasses. I would say. Correct. Uh, there must be an Indian with one with moustache. Yeah, one. yeah, I'd say there's someone. Looks like he's Indonesian, but still the the one on the boat. But my get that one wrong? <coughs> Probably not. <laughs> no. Okay, but anyway, Indonesian is not a nationality from here, but yeah. uh, uh, so I suppose there's a Malay person up, up right, right corner, right. right, okay, so, uh -huh. <laughs> so yeah, but so you're not actually talking about nationalities, but ethnic groups, right? Right. Basically. Hmm. Okay, so I suppose there's a Filipino somewhere. Right. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd say up left, left corner. No? Okay, then down right. Okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> right, and then, so the last one is up left, is it? Side? Yes, yes the last one, one is the up left. Mm. Yeah. I said Singaporean since the beginning. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you said they were all Singaporean. Yeah, no, I'm just <laughs> Okay, well, that's public private partnership, you see. Uh, this one is for you. Yeah, one more thing. Um, so, Mr. Grigo Blanche, uh, the big Apple designer Jonathan Tai mm -hmm. recently warned in the, recently warned the Swiss watch industry mm -hmm. about the launch of the Apple Eye Watch. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this will create complications for the jeweler of kings and king of jewelers? When you talk about complications, what type of complications <laughs> are you talking about? <laughs> no, I, I think it's great. Um, and I go back to what I was saying. I was talking about customer, uh, customer experience and customer expectations. Um, any new innovation is uh, is a, is a, is, a, is fuel uh, for what we do. Um, if you go back to the history of watchmaking, because it's true that sometimes we might wrongly might be perceived as because we carry strong heritage and strong history as um, as a maison, like many other jewelers, who are still stuck in the past. And I'm using stuck purposely in. The, uh, in this in, in this context, the reality is when you when you go and on watch blogs or when you start talking with uh, collectors, uh, they will tell you that there hasn't been so much creativity, so much innovation in the world of watchmaking uh, than over the last 10-15 years, and actually the the Maison Cartier has been uh, really driving uh, in that whole exercise. For instance. I'll give you just two examples. Uh, we, we created, um, now it's five years ago, the first watch uh, that would never require to be adjusted. Now adjustment for a watch, uh, I'll try and make this as simple, uh, simple as possible, but adjustment for the watch is just like when you have, uh, for the gentlemen in, the, car, in the, um, the room, like when you have a car, you have a carburetor that, so you can define the, uh, the uh, performance of your, of your engine. So it's exactly the same thing with a watch and it means that Every single watch that's created, mechanical watch, requires adjustment. So you can imagine all the complexities of having watchmakers, etc. behind it. So we came up with this brand new watch, which was called the ID1 concept watch, where we don't need to, to do adjustment, which was a, a true revolution in terms of uh, watchmaking. And then two years later, uh, we decided to challenge ourselves and to come out with a watch that would uh, by far beat every single standard in terms of uh, power reserve. Uh, a little bit, and if I go back into the car industry, a little bit like what some engineer schools do, they give a challenge, they give you a one liter of petrol and say try and get your car as far as possible. So there was quite a lot of innovation that went into it um, and that was the obviously very very uh, original ID2 watch that came two years later. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm, I'm illustrating this point to say whether it's on the right or whether it's on the left uh, innovation is what drives the success of any company. 
any maison, um, if we were not uh, constantly innovating, then we wouldn't be, I guess, we wouldn't be performing as great as we are today. So I think what uh, you see, at least on the left, is uh, very conducive to the success of what you have on the right. So you don't see the watch as a, as a big threat? I see it as something that will answer to new uh, clients' expectations, desires, uh, but I can also foresee that you're going to have quite a lot of people who are going to have a, maybe an eye watch to answer to certain requirements they have in their lives, but who will nonetheless also have a watch uh, of a more classical, I would say, uh, design. Like so, a Cartier, yeah. for example. One could say that. <laughs> <laughs> this one is again for you, uh, Mr. Blanche. What do you think, like the left image, the fake luxury industry, uh, that we can see in uh, many countries? Uh, well, I go back to the branding exercise I was uh, referring to early on. Um, and I have to say that in terms of uh, fighting uh, the fake, it's, it's obviously a very important, uh, very important exercise. And, and in that sense, uh, like many others, but the French government has been extremely instrumental and uh, very supportive, just like the Swiss government has been, um, in, uh, in rooting out uh, what is ultimately a multi-layered problem. Um, yes, there's an issue that's commercial, but I think deep down the most uh, critical aspects are not necessarily the commercial aspects. Um, there are constraints in terms of, uh, uh, and huge risk in terms of IP, intellectual property. Uh, also, and that should never be uh, um, put on the side, but most of the businesses or the people who are behind the, um, the counterfeits um, are also linked to, um, I would say, very shady side of the economy. Um, um, and I won't go further into that. So fighting, fighting uh, uh, counterfeit is, is an, essential, uh, an essential necessity. Now, at the same time, I think the best way for us to fight it is not necessarily to raid, uh, do uh, raids of, uh, of, uh, of shops, etc. I think that the governments can do very well. It's also for us to, in our boutiques, uh, like the one on the right, um, <laughs> explain really to our clients what uh, owning a true Cartier piece is about um, and making it very cl crystal clear what the difference between one and the other is. Now what's interesting is that on your left you have um, yeah, the goods. Um, when you go into the field of uh, jewelry and watchmaking, I can tell you that doing very good counterfeit is a much more difficult exercise. Okay, thank you. That's good. So, um, so you only had one set of yeah. pictures. But it was much harder. <laughs> the last question is for you, yeah, Mr. Ambassador. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, before closing the debate, one last question regarding uh, our school, ESSEC. Mm -hmm. So France and Singapore strive to develop new academic partnership with, for instance, the establishment of INSEAD or ESEC in Singapore. However, do you truly believe Singapore is a strategic spot for a French academic institution uh, to establish a campus? <laughs> well, yeah, in short, the answer is yes. <laughs> 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 but no uh, explanation. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. No, I think it is. I mean, it, it is in itself a... Um, um, an important choice uh, making the decision to invest heavily into a new campus which is a decision being made currently by ESSEC injecting a lot of money into a new campus to increase the, um, the capacity for, to, to welcome students uh, so by that I just mean that actually not all universities Grandes Ecoles and so on are making that decision so, I mean, it is naturally debatable whether that's the right choice. Or, I mean, a lot of other schools put the emphasis on exchange programs, right, which is a sort of more classical way to do it. But I do think that if you, precisely, if you believe that there's a big potential here both to maybe better expose your own French students to something different, and conversely, to have more students from the region, not only Singapore, of course, but the South Asian region, say, in particular, to come over to France and get a better feel of what France is about, what French companies have on offer. And, and beyond that, actually, from a purely academic point of view, the things that 
our teachers in a variety of fields have to tell uh, in the different areas of uh, sci um, science of management, then I do think it is a relevant choice. Uh, I think Singapore is providing a lot of help to those institutions in higher education that do wish to make that choice. And I think that's because they clearly understand it's also important for them. So definitely I think it's a relevant choice. It's a courageous choice though, of course, because again it involves actually a lot of money. But I think it is quite relevant to what Singapore is and aims to be even more in the years to come. So definitely it's a choice we support, that we encourage, and we'll do our, our best in 2015 to do that in, in a very strong way. Thank you very much. Okay, that's all for the debate. Now we can do a small Q&A session with the audience. If you have some questions to, to ask, You can introduce yourself and then ask a question. <coughs> Hello, uh, my question is for Mr. Dilatri. Uh, my name is Robin Louvon. Uh, I'm just joined in SEC uh, in September, but before that, uh, I made five years of studies at Sciences Um my, we, You were talking about um, the mitigation between um, a diplomacy of economy and a diplomacy of influence. Uh, we know that France has been involved against the death penalty, uh, especially at the United uh, Nations. Uh, there has been a strong co commitment. Uh, we also know that uh, Singapore is still applying the death penalty. So how do you conciliate um, your actions about that subject? Um, I'm sure you had concerns about that from the KLC. <laughs> and how do you conciliate that subject with the economy problem? Well, of course, the, the issue of death penalty is, a, is, a, is a, an important topic, not only for France, but actually for very many nations, including the European Union as a whole. Uh, clearly, this is carried out in a different format. We have a dialogue on that, of course. And you had the death penalty day recently, where the European Union undertook, and we support that, of course, uh, exchanges on that topic. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge this is a sovereign right of any state to define that sort of thing. And I think that on top of that, recently, Singapore actually, through its uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, very firmly reasserted that their society choice was to keep the death penalty. And we will continue, of course, to discuss that issue with them. But we're not at a stage, and I can remind you of uh, previous events, in particular with China, we're not at a stage where we sort of, sort of mix up different topics with one another. So very clearly, Singapore provides at the same time, even though death penalty, which was under a moratorium, by the way, until this summer. Uh, at the same time, Singapore provides a framework, a legal framework and environment which is perfectly suitable for companies, for undertaking business. So I think the idea again is not to sort of mix up different topics that have nothing to do with one another. If there, we have some legal issues with Singapore in the business field, we, we undertake that and we talk with them to that on, 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 the, um, on the level of business, right? So basically that's what I would uh, uh, what I would answer to your question, but definitely we're still discussing with Singaporeans on that issue, of course. It is important to us. Uh, good evening, thank you for coming to ESSEC. Uh, I have a question more on the uh, economic side and uh, on the French policy, uh, the French economic policy in France not affecting Singapore. So first of all, I would ask so, how um, what are the economic links between Singapore and France, and uh, if there are a lot of Singaporean investments in France, and how they perceive uh, the French economic policy, uh, does it affect their behavior in investing in France? I'm, I'm thinking you know, about the, the merger or the acquisition of GE and Alstom. Does like, the uh, intervention of the government have huge influence on their behaviors? Well, regarding economic links between the two countries, you have to look at the trade side and also separately at the investment side. Um, definitely trade has been growing very well over the past years. It hasn't been the case in 2013 for matters of growth in Europe and in France in particular. So exports and imports actually have gone down. 
But overall, the amounts are quite sizable. They're about 10 billion euros in total export import between the two countries. Um, and definitely the main challenge here is simply the growth path of France and how do our structural reforms make it possible and how does the European environment as a whole makes it possible for growth to, to take up again. Uh, and as you know, 2014 is a tricky year currently with zero growth. So that, that's one uh, side of uh, the as uh, one aspect of the problem. Second one, of course, is investments, and that, that's the one you were more targeting in your question. Uh, and there, basically, we, our companies, are using Singapore as a hub investment-wise for the whole of Southeast Asia. And that translates into figures. When you look at figures, you see that total French investment here is appro approximately 7 billion euros, which is quite huge. It's more than half of total French investments in ASEAN countries, in all 10 ASEAN countries. So I think they, our companies, like many others, have understood quite well the nature of Singapore and how they can use this place as headquarters, or also for manufacturing facilities, actually, and then re-exporting from there and so on. Um, Reverse-wise, um, actually, Singaporean companies as such in terms of industrial operations or services operations, haven't quite invested as much as we would like in France. Even though they have, uh, some of them are well known to you, even though you don't know the Singaporean. Take the Citadine Apart Hotel uh, network, for instance, that's actually Singaporean owned. And you've got some other examples, especially in the fields of hospitality and real estate. But beyond that, you have two sovereign funds in Singapore, who have already invested in, in France. But sometimes it's uh, financial investments. It's not necessarily uh, direct investments. So they are accounted for separately, I would say. Definitely, we have a close dialogue with them regarding reforms that are being carried out in France to make sure that they get a better grasp of what is going on, what is being done, the different efforts that are being carried out, both at a French and a European level. And they're obviously the... Um, um, foreign uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds, sorry, play an instrumental role because they have here a sort of leading capacity. What the choices they will make obviously will in a way show the direction for other private investors, for companies that are subsidiaries of those funds. And obviously this is obviously uh, extremely, extremely important. So currently actually things are not going badly on the front of foreign direct investment into France. And because I think people get an understanding of the changes that are being carried out and also have the, the very clear understanding of the fact that one of the problems that we had was probably instability of legislation, including uh, in terms of fiscal policy. And there it seems to me that they understand that the horizon is clearing up, but we have a clearer orientation in terms of public policies. Good evening. Uh, my name is Philippe Point. I'm an uh, ESSEC alumni, uh, also a teacher, a visiting teacher here, and a consultant. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, uh, in your eyes, and uh, according to your opinion, what are the priority sectors that uh, Singapore would like to favor, and how can ESSEC and uh, ESSEC uh, students uh, be preferential partners uh, for those uh, initiative, uh, what do you think would be the right direction to go to be uh, going along uh, that direction that you mentioned? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, the Economic Development Board, if you go on their website, they have very clearly identified a series of sectors that they believe are key to the future development of Singapore. I, I, I could just highlight a few, uh, a few of those, but very clearly one of the issues for Singapore is to retain a strong industrial basis not just be a services place, but an industrial basis. And very clearly, oil and gas, petrochemical industry, play a very significant role there. And you know the facilities on the, are on the island of Jurong, and they're still growing. So that clearly is one, one area. Another one, important one, is aeronautics. You know that the airport of Changi has de developed very well, but it's still growing. There are plans to have a T4 and a T5 by, by, by the next 10 years. 
to double the capacity of the airport. And on top of that, uh, Singapore is trying to, be, to, to become again a hub, but aeronautics-wise, in terms of uh, maintenance, repair, and overall, what we call MRO. And there we've got lots of French companies who are very much involved in that. So that's another key area. Then you've got the whole dimension of sustainable development and sustainable cities. What they call also here, more smartly, smart cities. There's this idea that it's sustainable, but on top of that, it's also more intelligent. It's more digital. It provides more services to the customers. And in the end, it's more efficient from the point of view of the consumption of energy, time, and so on. And there again, I do think that our French companies have a lot to do in that area. So just to take, taking those three examples, but we, we could carry on with a few others. I think what ESSEC, where ESSEC can play a very positive role is each time you can develop and bring here some expertise in that field. And I think typically sustainable cities, that's the smart cities, that's one of the key areas, I believe. If we can have a sort of joint effort on that, well, on the one hand, you have companies joining forces together to have a sort of grouped marketing for French offer. In the end, some will win and some will lose in, in the bids, but that's not the issue. You offer something that really covers the whole spectrum of the needs of a smart city. And if on top of that, additionally to that, you have this expertise at an academic level, and if you're able also to bring in some research and development through other institutions, typically like CNRS or that sort of uh, scientific player, then I think you have much better chances, chances of succeeding. So overall, I think that's one of the, what strikes me, I've only been here for one year, but one of the things that an embassy can do, it does not have by itself a lot of power or a lot of money. But what it can do is put people together and make sure they all join forces on a set of limited, limited number of priorities. And I think typically that the, those fields we mentioned are relevant to Singapore. We've already got some good strengths in the French offer there, but we need to bring that in a more efficient way to the Singaporeans. Maybe one last question. Uh, I have a question concerning uh, your experience in Asia. Would you, would you say that being part of the French community is an advantage or a disadvantage to get acquainted with the uh, Singaporean culture? Your turn. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, a good one. Uh, my wife is Dutch. Uh, my children go to the international school. Um, so I have some, one French colleague, as I mentioned earlier on. Um, people from different surroundings. I guess uh, friendships and connections are not any necessarily defined by the passports or ethnic groups. It's more about uh, interconnections. So I, I would say I'm not that connected to the to the French community here. Um, actually, is the first uh, time I meet some new Um I'm not that uh, that connected uh, because I don't uh, make a point of of making it a, a defining element in who I meet or who I exchange with. And I think that's the most important element. Uh, you will get to fully enjoy, and we're going 300, uh, 360 degrees back to where we were at the beginning, you'll fully enjoy the benefits of uh, living abroad, uh, discovering new cultures, uh, not by stopping your relationship just at a nationality standpoint, but more the experiences that everybody can bring to you. If I may just add very shortly one word on that. Uh, indeed, I don't think a nationality quite defines you. It's part of what, who you are, of course, but, but, but that's it. And we're here in a very open society, actually. Singaporeans travel quite a lot, even though not that many live abroad. They often return home. But they're open to difference, to a difference in culture and so on. So definitely, I think that, and it's lucky for all of us who live here, probably being French is, is, is in a way an asset in that there's a certain recognition of what France represents, and that's positive. But at the same time, it doesn't define you, and uh, I'm sure that uh, certain members of the French community uh, find it easy to discuss an exchange with Singaporeans and others much less so, and that's probably because of 
who they are, not because of their nationality. So basically, I don't think it's really an issue. Anyway, I can't hide the fact that I'm French, that, that's for sure. <laughs> and I don't find it, uh, I don't find it, of course, a, a, a handicap. I don't think that's, they, they, they don't think in those terms, I don't think so. You want one more question? Mr. Ambassador, from what I understand, your experience in Beijing um, stimulated your interest in Asia, and I wanted to know what made you take the leap between China and Singapore, which are two very different countries, and yes, that's it. <laughs> well, it, it was a sort of bizarre leap, <laughs> one must speak for leap, because in between I worked for six years for Caisse de Depot back in France, so it's a sort of, uh, yeah, I don't know what sort of animal makes such leaps, but uh, uh, of course it's a completely different Asia, even though there are very strong links between, uh, between Singapore and China, ethnically speaking, culturally speaking, economically wise also, they're very close links. But I mean, it's. Uh, I suppose it sparked my 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 interest for again for in international affairs, and and uh, I'd had the chance of having a, a look at it through an economic prism in a way, only through that because I was economic counselor there, and uh, I've always been attracted to cultural differences. I mean, uh, part of my family uh, is not French, and um, so and I went to. Uh, an international school when I was in Paris, so I suppose that already I had this spark of interest for different things. But definitely, actually, it all started back in uh, in uh, 20 years ago when I was seconded to a company called L'Oréal in cosmetics, and that was in Jakarta a long time ago. And definitely, that was where I actually I had this first feel of Southeast Asia. And I suppose, in a way, it was both that and my experience in Beijing, which uh, which. Um, determine my, my wish to come back into the region and discover a, a still, still, I would say, very different part of Asia than just China. So, so that's basically the sort of personal answer I can give you on that. Mm. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nanchi and Mr. Liberté. Uh, we'll now have a small cocktail uh, in, the, in the lobby uh, where you can ask your uh, question more discreetly, <laughs> in a more informal way to our two guests. <laughs>